Okay, so I'm presenting collaborative work done with Marie Pinyango and Chisushin, both of whom are here. Um, so let's start, let's get a sense of what metonymy is. So yeah. most basically, metonymy is when you use a term to refer to a related meaning. So if you say something like, I read Martin Wickstrom in high school, uh, what you mean is that you read the, the written works of Martin Wickstrom, uh, not, not the person itself. So let me show you two more specific definitions of metonymy. So from our 2016 paper, we say that metonymy is the semantic relation that allows a given term to be used to refer, not to its original denotation, but to another one which is informative and uh, for which it has some functional correspondence. Um, so uh, from a, a paper by Eve Clark and colleagues, we see a similar definition. So metonymy is an expression used to refer to something that falls outside of its conventional denotation and has a clear associative relation linking that conventional denotation and a contextually determined one. So what we can gather from this is that the use of metonymy is a linguistic tool that exploits these conceptual connections uh, for making reference in a given context. And so uh, in our paper, we explored two types of metonymy. The first one we called systematic metonymy, which comes in a variety of flavors. One is producer for products, so something like students read Toni Morrison in high school, uh, where, again, the use of Toni Morrison means her written works, not the person uh, herself. Uh, we have things like place for event, go road home every day during Vietnam. Uh, and we compared systematic metonymy with circumstantial metonymy, which is more context dependent. So for example, in a restaurant, one server says to another, the quinoa bowl asks for another glass of kombucha. These are updated examples, right? Um, or like at, at an ice cream parlor, right? uh, someone says, are, are you the banana split? Right? And they, of course, they're referring to you, the orderer, the customer who ordered it, rather than the actual object itself. Right? So traditionally, these two types of metonymy have been treated separately in the linguistic literature. So the first one, the systematic one, uh, is treated as being performed as a lexical operation, whereas the latter is being performed as some sort of pragmatic inference uh, in a given context. And so instead, in our paper, we find psycholinguistic and neurolinguistic evidence uh, that supports a unified analysis. And so what this unified analysis is saying is that uh, the two types of metonymy actually share the exact same underlying conceptual operation, which is just creating a referential dependency, uh, which is connecting an explicit uh, entity with an implicit one in a conceptually associated and uh, compositionally licensed way. So the two types of metonymy definitely do differ, though. And where they differ is in how much context they need. So systematic metonymy is more conventionalized and thus requires less context, whereas circumstantial metonymy requires more context. And so the setup here, uh, you know, in the end, is that these two are more of like ends of a single spectrum uh, of contextual dependence on this same conceptual operation of linking two entities. So um, findings from two brain type measures uh, support this analysis. And so in both, what we see is a single like neural signature, which is like the establishment uh, at the word level of this referential dependency. And then in the circumstantial metonymy in both, in both brain measures, there are additional indices of contextualization effort. So there's additional work that's being done for the circumstantial. So in order to successfully do metonymy, we have to have a few things in place. And so the first one we're going to call a, a rich constellation of situation episodes in memory. And these give rise to generalized schemas for participant configuration. So let me go through that. What does that mean? So when you hear something like the quinoa bowl ordered, you're getting the conceptual structure of an ordering event, which uh, may, might involve something like a, a restaurant, a food, a customer payment, and a server. So you, you retrieve all of this in your knowledge of what order it means. And so if you have this schema, uh, which could be the precursor to you know, an event structure, you can easily connect the named explicit entity, the quinoa bowl, with the understood implicit entity, which is the customer. Right? That is, it's easier for you to find a supportive uh, communicative, co uh, communicative context for that utterance. So if you've never been in a restaurant, it would be a lot harder for you to make that conceptual, con uh, conceptual connection underlying this metonymy. Right? 
So a rich bank of these situation episodes and schemas in memory will just give you more possible reference uh, uh, to pick and choose from uh, to license that external uh, participant in the metadynamic relation. Okay, so, but, but just having like a wealth of experiences isn't going to be enough. Uh, so we also want to say that you have to be able to use these, uh, this rich constellation of schemas. And we're going to call this context sensitivity really broadly. So how does it play out here? So being context sensitive means that you're aware of communicative intent. And thus, you're going to be actively using contextual information to resolve ambiguities like metonymies. And so how, you know, how would we measure something like that? Um, so one tool that's been used is the Autism Quotient Questionnaire. And this has been used by linguists and psychologists as a way to measure the degree of context sensitivity in individuals. And so we've used this tool ourselves across several studies and have found systematic variation across individuals in this measure. So we're going to tell you a little bit more about this tomorrow and what we think it means, so stay tuned for that. I'm going to skip it now. Um, and so the way that this works is that the lower your context sensitivity, the higher your AQ is going to be. So it's, uh, it's in, you know, the scale goes the other way. And this means you're going to have lower awareness of communicative intent, and you'll be able to, you're, you're going to have a harder time to do this metonymy. So now we have our two uh, components of this context construal ability. Right? Uh, we have this uh, the rich constellation of situation episodes memory and this awareness of community intent. And so if this is what adults rely on uh, to do metonymy, it begs the question of if this ability is maturational, and if so, how does it come online? Right? And so, in the literature at the time uh, that we were starting this project, we found a really striking production and comprehension asymmetry. Uh, so researchers have documented uh, metonymy production as, uh, as early as two, like really good metonymies, uh, very, very productive in, in these children. Right? But uh, comprehension, though it has some documented cases as early as three, was not really reliable in tasks until maybe like 10 or 12, depending on uh, which study you look at. Uh, and so generally these studies have attributed this, this deficit to uh, theory of mind limitations in figurative language processing. And so this kind of sets the stage for us to test our operationalization of metonymy comprehension in children. Okay, so uh, we have our first two components of context control. And so while well, the first is clearly going to be subject to maturational constraints, right? You need to be, you know, have lots of experiences to grow your, your uh, bank of situation ex episodes. Um, we take context sensitivity to be generally age independent. And of course we use age and AQ respectively to index these components. And so what would we expect uh, to find in how children treat these two types of metonymy, systematic and circumstantial? So because both metonymies depend on the same referential dependency, which relies on, on this uh, collection of situation episodes, we should expect uh, the same developmental trajectory for both types in terms of age. Uh, but in terms of context sensitivity, we would expect uh, to see that AQ should play out more for circumstantial, because that's the one that requires a lot more contextualization. So let me show you that graphically, because I think it's easier. Um, so here are two plots. On the x-axis we have the two measures, age and AQ, and on the y-axis will be the dependent variable for a metonymy comprehension task. So we have two of those. And so for systematic we would pr pr uh, predict this comprehension to increase with age, and also for comprehension to decrease with lower context sensitivity. So the less able you're use, uh, you are to use contextual information, the, the harder it's going to be for you to do metonymy. So we have that negative correlation there. For circumstantial, we would expect comprehension to, uh, there we go, uh, to increase with age, but uh, in terms of AQ, we would uh, expect a more dramatic correlation, uh, because circumstantial metonymy demands a lot more contextual support. So being less context sensitive uh, would make you worse at circumstantial than for systematic, just because it needs a lot more of that contextual support. And so we did two studies. We did a self-paced reading study with kids from 7 to 12 and a context elicitation study with kids from 5 to 12. So I'm going to focus on the study two, but I need to give you the result of study one first. 
And so in study one, we compared uh, the metonymy comprehension of process, uh, of metonymy comprehension processing profile in these kids with, uh, with a sample of adults. And so the stimuli looked like this. So we had a context. So nowadays, most college students read the poems of Martin Wickstrom, wrote about England. And they usually get to read Martin Wickstrom, or they usually get to read Wickstrom when they're freshmen. And that was compared to a literal control. So uh, most college students learn about Martin Wickstrom in his unusual life. They sometimes get to meet Wickstrom when he gives lectures. So these are, this is the relevant comparison. And we have a, a similar comparison for the circumstantial type. So the ham sandwich in the corner uh, needs another cup of coffee versus the tall woman in the corner. And so long story short, uh, we find, uh, we find adult-like um, adult behavior uh, in children, uh, given this sufficient contextual support. So they show these. Can, can, sorry. Can process. They usually get to read Wickstrom when they are freshmen. Sorry. The, you you literally had seven seven year olds reading. They usually get to read Wickstrom when they are freshmen. Um, they might not have gotten this set. They got a subset of the sentences that were filtered for yeah. more Some like age appropriate things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so they show, the reading times are much slower for the kids. So you basically see the same shape of the of the reading times, but but like much higher on the graph. And so again, the relevant the relevant comparison is between the metonymic and literal. So it doesn't matter how fast it was, but if the differences uh, were at the same places, right? And so this uh, parallels the finding uh, in the Falkman et al. study that supported the same idea that kids can do metonymy. It's not that they can't do it. The hard part is getting that contextual support. So when you give them the context, mm -hmm. it's fine. It's great. So let's move on to uh, study two. So we directly tested kids developing context construal ability in this task. So we had 48 uh, children, and we gave them prompts um, like, my dad collected Hutchinson for a really long time, or are you the banana split? And we did this in an interview format, and we asked them to give us possible scenarios, interlocutors, or motivations. So like, can you think of someone who might have said something like this? Uh, can you think of where they might have been, or, or what, they, what they were trying to say? Um, and we wanted to uh, see if they could come up with this licensing context that would support the metonym. And all the responses were coded binarily for a correct metonymic interpretation or an incorrect literal interpretation. And I'll show you some examples in the next slide. And we also gave them the uh, child version of the, of the AQ questionnaire. So I'm going to play some of the responses. So for the sentence, my dad collected Hutchinson for a really long time. Here's one. Artists collected maybe pieces from them, artifacts collected from them, and <laughs> great answer, right? Great baton. Um, you know, you fully get it, right? And it's quite a rich, like, conceptual structure for that one. Um, here's another one. The dad collected that for a long time. A tip of fish. So here we get an interpretation, and this one would be coded as wrong, where they, they are taking that word to be like the name of some kind, right? It's a type of fish. Uh, kids went with like types of rocks, types of birds, things like this, right? And so for something like the pepperoni pizza wants another cup of orange soda. Um, maybe someone that ordered the pepperoni pizza wants more orange soda. Right, like I couldn't have said it better myself, right? <laughs> and then and then we have this one. <laughs> So one thing is that you can tell it's it's like he's he's working on it. He's he's like uh, there's there's a lot going on. Yet we still end up with this quite literal interpretation, though he's clearly like that's weird uh, and tries to resolve that right. So there's still a lot of effort going on, and so that would be coded incorrectly. Um, so let's look at the results. And here I'm going to show the mean percentage of correct responses for each subject as a function of age. So there are going to be two points per participant, one for the uh, for the circumstantial and one for the uh, systematic, so blue and red. 
And so again, what we expect is for both metonymy types to show a developmental trajectory. So we would attribute this to the, the rich uh, you know, bank of situation episodes uh, component of contextual control ability. And so we find just that. Um, and this supports that, that age-dependent component. So the more situations that you've been in, the more situations you can generalize over to create these schemas that give you possible uh, reference for this external uh, metonymic uh, participant. And so let's look at the same data, and this is going to be plotted as a function of AQ. So more context sensitive is going to be on your left, and less is this way. And here we expect a negative correlation. So this is going to be like the higher your AQ, the less context sensitive you are, and therefore the worse you're going to perform on this task. So specifically, the correlation for the circumstantial should be more pronounced, because in this one, you really need to be using this contextualization ability. Whereas for systematic, you actually get quite a bit of it just from the predicate. So just from read or just from sing, you, you, can, you already get quite a bit of information. And so that's also exactly what we find. So this, uh, the blue correlation is significant and the, the red one is not. And so let me just summarize what I've showed you today. So in study one, we showed that children can comprehend metonymy when supported by context, even at an early age. Um, great. And, um, and together with the findings in Falcom et al. 2017, the limiting factor in children's metonymy comprehension seems to be their ability to come up with this supported context, their context construal ability. And so in study two, um, we showed that metonymic comprehension is subject to maturation. So specifically, participant age is an index, uh, as an index of how rich their bank of experiences is, significantly correlated uh, with performance in the context solicitation task. And so we also showed that context construability is variable across individuals. So the, the AQ is actually, uh, is not correlated with age, right? It's a different effect. And uh, we use this existing measure of context sensitivity that's been used in, in all sorts of language and psycholinguistic studies. Right? So what can we take away from all this? So these results are painting a picture where metonymy is this powerful referential tool for communication in both children and adults. And it's useful for economical reasons. So uh, Falkman et al. 2017 found that it might actually be easier for young, student, uh, for young children to use metonyms instead of these complex MPs. Something like, if, you wanna, if you're like talking about what game you want to play, they can say something like, oh, I want to play straws, rather than I want to play uh, the game with straws. And so uh, one thing we can learn from that is that metonymy isn't this, uh, isn't this like crazy exotic phenomenon that we're doing. It's something like nicknaming. Uh, you know, like shortcutting, which uh, uh, we have a lot of devices to do that in our language, right? And so the other side is that successful comprehension is dependent on a rich life experience, um, as well as the ability to make use of contextual information. So when a context, when you don't get a context, you just get kind of like a, a metonym out in the blue, um, it's up to you as the comprehender to come up with a possible context to license that situation. And so this difference helps us understand that reported asymmetry, uh, where it's, there are different tasks that you need to be doing when you're producing a metonymy versus uh, comprehending metonymy. And so the idea I want to end on is that in our view, metonymy comprehension is just ordinary language comprehension. So here we have linguistic meaning, conceptual structure, and contextual information all coming together in real time uh, to form different parts of what we were talking about as the utterance meaning, this kind of larger composite of meaning. And so the use of context to, to support uh, so-called non-denotational meaning is not some, like I said, exotic extra processing, but just the, the way that you know, language works. Um, so with, on that note, you know, I want to thank uh, these people and institutions for their intellectual, uh, technical, and financial support. So thanks. <laughs> And Andy, uh, yeah. I just wondered if um, you had a, an account of impossible or extremely improbable um, metonymic extensions in this circumstantial group. So in particular, for me, um, the, the quinoa bowl ordered kombucha works perfectly well, but the red beard needs a few minutes in the microwave cannot be interpreted as the dish that the, red, the man with the red beard ordered needs a few minutes in the microwave. Although you do get 
the red beard needs his check, you know, as right. in the uh, Nunberg right. type examples. So, so why can't you move, since you have that, that list of features that includes customer and dish ordered, why you can't go in the opposite direction? Right, so something we talk about in the 2016 paper is that there's this addi additional dimension of like salience or noteworthiness. And so I think a priori we have different uh, levels of salience that we assign to different features. But you could definitely come up with a context. Like mm -hmm. let's say you're in a, in a restaurant that only serves people with facial hair. So this is like the like, identifying information um, where it's not like the red beard, but like the red beard his dishes in the microwave, or the red beard. No, but it's not his dishes in the microwave. The, the key oh, thing is right. the red beard yeah. is in the microwave, right. meaning right. the dish that right. the guy, I think no matter how salient that is, <laughs> it's not going to work. Yeah. 